Ezekiel 37, beginning in verse 1. And ladies and gentlemen, this is the word of God. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones, and he led me around among them, and behold, there were many, very many, on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay sinews upon you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded and as I prophesied, there was a sound and behold, a rattling and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I'll put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you would unveil your truth to us through your word. And in this, be glorified, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm sure, like me, you've been asked on occasion, what is it that you do? What's your job? What's your occupation? Oftentimes, when I answer that question, it's a conversation killer. Uh, When I say I'm a pastor, it's amazing the faces you see in response to that. Some are bright and cheerful. Oh, great. Others, like, wish they hadn't asked. I remember asking uh, to be excused from this, but I can't be excused from this. This is something we all have to face, that question, what is it that you do? And when I'm asked it, I give an honest answer. I once was uh, in a situation where I was asked that, what is it that you do? I said, a pastor. And this lady said, well, I'm not into organized religion. Thankfully, I was prepared. I said, oh, so you're into disorganized religion. And she didn't know what to say to that. I don't think she was into religion at all. But disorganized religion is religion that we invent, that is a a, a commodity. It's sellable. It's something that can be marketed, something that can be approved. And there's performance ratings for it as to the best kind of thing you can offer folk in the realm of religion. But if you look at the Bible, you never see God asking his people to ask those around them what kind of service they would come to. It never happened. Moses was never asked to take a poll of the surrounding nations. God never said to Moses, go to the Hittites and the Jebusites and uh, knock on their tents and ask them what kind of music they're into, what kind of uh, service they would like, how long should the service be, Uh, uh, how how long an address, a sermon would you like, none at all, five minutes, eight minutes, what would you like, and then uh, Moses, go and design a service that will reach them where they are. The exact uh, exact opposite of that occurs in our Bibles where God commanded Moses to erect 
a tabernacle. In fact, let's go there to the book of Exodus chapter 26. Moses, take a poll. Find out what they would come to. Uh, No, never happened, either in the Old or the New Testament. Exodus chapter 26, where we have a record of all of the items needed for the tabernacle. And I just want to highlight something that occurs over and over and over with almost redundant occurrence. Exodus chapter 26, look with me in verse 30, and then uh, just realize this is God's directives. Uh, Exodus 26 verse 30, Then you shall erect the tabernacle according to the plan for it that you were shown on the mountain. In other words, I showed you something, now perform it. Act in accordance with what you've seen on the mountain. You've had an experience where I showed you exactly what I want as God. Now you go and erect the tabernacle accordingly. Look at verse 32. And you shall hang it on four pillars of acacia overlaid with gold, with hooks of gold and four bases of silver. Verse 33, and you shall hang the veil from the claps and bring the ark of the testimony in there within the veil and the veil shall separate for you the holy place from the most holy. You shall put the mercy seat on the ark of the testimony in the most holy place and you shall set the table outside the veil and the lampstand on the south side of the tabernacle opposite the table and you shall put the table on the north side. You shall make a screen for the entrance of the tent. So it goes on. Go to chapter Thirty-nine specific instructions. Verse thirty-two. Thus, after all this, all of the intervening chapters tell us what was required and what was performed. Then, verse thirty-two. Thus, all the work of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting was finished, and the people of Israel did according to all that the Lord had commanded Moses. So they did. Verse 33, Then they brought the tabernacle to Moses, the tent and all its utensils, its hooks, its frames, its bars, its pillars and its bases, the covering of the tanned ram skins and goat skins and the veil of the screen, the ark of the testimony with its poles and the mercy seat, the table with its utensils and the bread of the presence, the lampstand of pure gold and its lamps with the lamps set and all of its utensils and the oil for the light, the golden altar, the anointing oil and the fragrant incense and the screen for the entrance of the tent and the bronze altar and its great of bronze, its poles and all its utensils, the basin and its stand, the hangings of the court, its pillars, its bases, the screen for the gate of the court, its cords and its pegs, and all the utensils for the service of the tabernacle for the tent of meeting. And finally work garments for ministering in the holy place, the holy garments for Aaron the priest, and the garments of his sons for their service as priest. Now look at this. According to all that the Lord had commanded Moses... So the people of Israel had done all the work. And Moses saw all the work, and behold, they had done it as the Lord had commanded, so had they done it. Then Moses blessed them. On to chapter 40, look at verse 16. This Moses did according to all that the Lord commanded him, so he did. Look at verse 19. So he spread the tent over the tabernacle and put the covering of the tent over it as the Lord had commanded Moses. Verse 21. And he brought the ark of the tabernacle and set up the veil of the screen and and screened the ark of the testimony as the Lord had commanded Moses. Are we getting the point yet? Verse 25. And he set up the lamps before the Lord as the Lord had commanded Moses. Moses, verse 27, and burned fragrant incense on it as the Lord had commanded Moses. Verse 29, and he set the altar of burnt offering at the entrance of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting and offered on it the burnt offering and the grain offering as the Lord had commanded Moses. Verse 32, when they went into the tent of meeting and when they approached the altar, they washed as the Lord commanded Moses. Verse 33, and he erected the court around the tabernacle and the altar and set up the screen of the gate of the court. So Moses finished the work. So everything that God had commanded, 
Moses and the people of Israel had performed. Then we have an unusual word, but a very important word in verse 34. Then, and only then, only when all things were done according to what had been commanded, then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, they did not set out till the day it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and fire was in it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel, throughout all their journeys. book of Exodus concludes with a finished tabernacle and the presence of God symbolized by the cloud, and by the fire. Moses finished the work then. Verse 34 and verse 35 in this chapter describes God's abiding presence, indicating his pleasure, his good pleasure, his approval. And what is very clear from these verses, these chapters we've read, is that God only gives approval when all things are done according to his specifications. He's the Lord who is to be worshipped. He does not say, how would you like to worship? He instructs his people on how to worship. And they were to move with that cloud. This was a nomadic people who had no fixed land at this point in terms of where they were living. And they were moving with the cloud, the fire by night, the cloud by day. On to the New Testament, I'd like us to go to the book of Acts now, Acts chapter 26. A lot of scripture already, but we're setting a precedent, establishing a principle. Acts chapter 26. Here Paul is giving his defense before King Agrippa. We're jumping into his testimony as he recounts his conversion. Look in verse 9, Acts 26 verse 9. I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I did so in Jerusalem. I not only looked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. So he's saying I was involved in the death of Christians. And I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. He hunted them down. He was radically ravage-centered. Look at verse 12. In this connection, I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun that shone all around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you've seen me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you. He's sending him to the Gentiles. Then this is your commission, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Verse 19, Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Moses saw something on a mountain. Saul, as he then was named Paul, saw something. He had a heavenly vision. Jesus appeared to him. I want to ask this question, is that the pattern for us? In many sectors of the church, you would think the answer would be in the affirmative. Yes, 
Pastor, if you're going to rock and roll, if you're going to make a difference, if you're going to be current, you've got to have seen something. You've got to go up on a mountain and have an experience. You've got to see something and come down and tell us what you saw. If you've got a vision for a church, it's got to be because an angel appeared to you or Jesus himself appeared to you. You went up to heaven. That's the kind of pressure that's out there. You've got to have something special. When Paul was instructing Timothy in the ways of God with his final letter that he would give him, we read of it in 2 Timothy. That's what we have in that particular book. I'd like you to go again to 2 Timothy and uh, read what is familiar to, I'm sure, most of us here. 2 Timothy chapter 3, recognizing that he's about to depart this world. He writes of that in the very next chapter. But here in his final letter to Timothy, he's basically saying this, I'm leaving, I'm about to depart, and what I'm telling you is important stuff. I've been around people who know they are just hours or minutes away from the presence of the Lord. It's a privilege to be there at that time. What I notice is this, they don't talk trivial stuff. They don't talk about the trivial. They don't say, I always wish I had a green front door rather than red. I always wish we got that new refrigerator you were asking about, honey. They they talk about big stuff. They say things like, will you tell my brother I forgive him? Will you tell my mother I love her? Big stuff. And here the big stuff, as Paul is leaving Timothy from this world, he's writing a letter with his final words. He gives him a charge. And he says, look, you know the scripture. You've known it from childhood. Stay with it. Teach that. Here's why, verse 16, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. One translation reads, thoroughly equipped for every good work. John Frame writes this, scripture contains all the divine words needed for any aspect of human life. And here Paul tells Timothy, everything you need for your ministry, everything is found in the Word of God. And then he goes on. That becomes the basis of the charge he gives in chapter 4, verse 1. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by His appearing in His kingdom, preach, herald the Word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete Patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure. They'll not put up with sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Then what follows are his departing words. I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure has come. I once heard an illustration about a hiker who was going to hike the Grand Canyon. And he made a list of all the things, all the items he would need for the task, including water, including a compass, including, as I say, a number of things. He totaled up, I believe it was 28 items, including the boots he would need, the kind of shoes he would have to have, uh, a hat, all of these items and uh, he totaled them to be 28 items. And in this illustration I heard, there were two stores at the top of the Grand Canyon. And as the man looked into each of the stores, one of the stores had eight of the items. The other store had all 28 of the items he needed. And the illustration was this. Just as the man would find all he needed in the one store, so... The Bible has everything needed for Timothy and his ministry. He doesn't need an experience. He doesn't need to see something. He doesn't need a vision. He just needs to have access to the Word of God, to study it, as chapter 2 verse 15 tells him. Study to show yourself approved by God. That was his instruction. Rather than go to a mountain, see something, go to your library, go to the book place, the place where you can lay books on a table, study the Word of God, find out what it says, and herald that Word. That's it. That's all you need. That's all you need for your life. That's all you need for your ministry. That's the big picture here. The Word of God gives us everything we need. It equips us thoroughly for every good work. 
I'm leaving you, Paul says. Paul writes, but you have the word and it fully equips you. You don't need to go and find out where Brother Big Pete is to get answers. You've got the word of God. You've got the word of God. For every task of ministry, you are loaded. You are fully equipped. So study, show yourself approved to God, and then let loose, preach the word. That's the divine command. Spurgeon once said this, the word of God can take care of itself and will do so if we preach it and cease defending it. See you that lion? They've caged him for his preservation. Shut him up behind iron bars to secure him from his foes. See how a band of armed men have gathered together to protect the lion. What a clatter they make with their swords and spears. These mighty men are intent on defending a lion. Oh, fools, oh, slow of heart, open that door. Let the Lord of the forest come forth free. Who will dare to encounter him? What does he want with your guardian care? Let the pure gospel go forth in all of its lion-like majesty, and it will soon clear its own way and ease itself of its adversaries. Yes, there are people that oppose the Word of God. Let the Word of God loose anyway. It's a lion. It can defend itself. Let the lion loose. That's our mandate. Ladies and gentlemen, without doubt, the greatest move of God in the history of the church since the book of Acts was something called the Protestant Reformation, where entire countries came under the sound of the gospel. They had been in darkness, now light had come by the preaching of God's word. Entire nations under the sway of the gospel. The main instrument of that time was a man called Martin Luther, although there were certainly others. Did he seek a heavenly experience? Did he go up on a mountain? Was he knocked off a high horse? And did the risen Christ appear to him? No, not at all. And here are his own words. From the beginning of my reformation, I've asked God to send me neither dreams, nor visions, nor angels, but to give me the right understanding of his word, the holy scriptures. For I've For as long as I have God's word, I know that I'm walking in his way and that I shall not fall into any error or delusion. Was Martin Luther lacking because he did not have the experience that some think or claim they have? Not at all. He was fully loaded. He let the lion loose and Germany and other nations were impacted by the gospel. The Puritan John Owen, he has a famous quote, if private revelations agree with Scripture, they are unnecessary, and if they disagree, they are false. You've got the word, what else do you need? You see, what happens between my ears, between your ears, is never as authoritative as the Bible. No one in the Bible ever said this, I believe the Lord might be saying, No, they were saying, thus says the Lord. This is what the Lord says. And it was very, very clear. Justin Peters once said this, if you want to hear God, read the Bible. If you want to hear God audibly, read it aloud. Dan Phillips, Scripture is sufficient for everything for which we need a word from God. Justin Peters again, if you have to wonder if God spoke to you, be sure of this, he didn't. This is where I'm sure God has spoken. This is where I know God has spoken. The B-I-B-L-E, from cover to cover, from Genesis to maps. This is the word of God. (laughs) Hallelujah. Later in reflecting on all that happened, later on in his life, he looked back. And while he prayed not to have these kind of experiences, he prayed just to have a good understanding, a right understanding of his word. Later on, he wrote this. He says, take me. For example, I opposed indulgences and all papists, but never by force. I simply taught, preached, wrote God's word. Otherwise, I did nothing. And then, while I slept or drank Wittenberg beer with my Philip, his friend Philip of Armsdorf, The word so greatly weakened the papacy that never a prince or emperor did such damage to it. I did nothing. The word did it all. How does any of this relate to us? Well, as we look at King's Church, you might ask me, John, have you seen something? Tell us. Well, uh, 
No. Well, have you prayed that you might see something? Well, well, well no. What, what I've done is I've, I've prayed and I've studied and um, a picture has formed in my mind. I've gone to God's Word and I've seen what it says and a picture has formed in my mind. But I, I can't say the Lord has spoken to me other than He's spoken to me in the Scripture. And as I read the Scripture impressions come to my mind of, oh, that's what that will look like if I do, if we do what this word says. When the Bible says, give yourself to the public reading of Scripture, in my mind's eye, you know what I see? Someone standing up and reading the Scripture in public. That's it. Well, that's it. Uh, Haven't you got anything better? Uh, No, that's it. Well, what's your plan? Have you noticed in your New Testament, God, by the hand and the writings of Paul, we never read of this. Timothy, tell us your five-year plan. Tell me, you, sh- you, be able, you should be able to sniff and even smell the carpet at the third building from here. You know what color it is, right? You can see it. Just picture it. Put it get, get an artist to, to paint a canvas image of that church building you have. And, and tell me, what's your five-year plan? Okay, what's your plan for the young people? What's your plan for the children? What's your plan for the, the, the more senior people? Tell us your plan. No, preach the word, Timothy. And if you don't, you're in trouble because you're going to answer to God. He's going to judge the living and the, and the dead. It's going to scare the heebie-jeebies out of Timothy if he reads this. And by the way, he did. You've got enough to answer for. But it, there was never this pressure. But in the emails I receive every week, there's this I can get you to 200 people if you just do this. It worked over here. It worked. Here's a sermon series that is ripe for the occasion. There's, there's only three verses of Scripture in it, but boy, people love it. Sorry. All, all I'm called to do is stay in my study till I've understood His Word, pray, 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 and then let the lion out and see what God does. That's it. I believe the greatest need of our world and therefore the greatest need of our people, us, me included, is to know God as he really is and the gospel as it really is and you can't have one without the other. God is the gospel. God is the goal of the gospel. The goal of the death of Christ is to bring people to God and to enjoy him forever. That's it. And a pulpit is where God's Word is exposed to human hearts. I believe God's Word is supernatural. It is by the power of the Holy Spirit that we have the inspired Word of God before us. People have given their lives just in a natural sense for the proclamation of the Word of God, for the revelation of the Scriptures to be made available to people. But as wonderful as that is, it's even more precious because every word is God-breathed out of the mouth of God. It is precious beyond precious to have even a verse of Scripture, yet we've got an entire 66-book canon of Scripture. And this word is supernatural, supernatural in origin. But I also know this, hungry hearts, that's supernatural. So we go back to the book of uh, Ezekiel, if we'll go back to chapter 37, Ezekiel was in a quandary. He was put into a desert place in the middle of a valley. The hand of the Lord was upon him, and this valley was full of bones. As we relate to our own situation, William Still once wrote this, The pastor is called to feed the sheep. Really? That's it? That's all that goes on? Yeah. I don't know if you've ever seen sheep being fed. It's not an exciting thing. There's no circus about it. There's no, really no, not usually any cameras that come along and say, let's catch the shepherd feeding the sheep. No, he just comes with a bag of uh, meal and puts it in a trough and the sheep wake up and come and eat, and that's kind of it. And see you tomorrow. That's it. But the food is wonderful. The sheep love it. The sheep love sheep food. Now, if you want to entertain goats, you've got to bring the circus. You've got to do something better today than you did last week. If last week was good, how do we top that? Let's have a think tank meeting. Okay, we gave bicycles away last week. What can we do next month? What can we do? Any ideas? Let's get other people in. Let me, let me just re- rehearse something that I'm sure you've heard from other folk too. 
What you win them with is what you win them to. If you win them with entertainment, you've got to keep them by entertainment. But if you win them by the power of the word of God, guess what? God has gone to work supernaturally in human hearts and he'll keep everything he starts and finish it. Praise the Lord. The pastor's called to feed the sheep, even if the sheep don't want to be fed. He is certainly not to become an entertainer of goats. Let goats entertain goats and let them do it out in goat land. You will certainly not turn goats into sheep by pandering to their goatishness. That was written centuries ago. How apt is that today? R.C. Sproul said this, It is a task of the pastor and of the church to feed the sheep. If someone who is not a sheep comes in, that's fine, but we're not going to change the menu and give the sheep goat food. Amen. You see, there's a massive gulf, a massive chasm between preference and conviction. Preferences are things that we can choose to either embrace or not. A pink shirt rather than a white shirt or a blue shirt or a black shirt. But it's not really uh, eternal stuff going on when we make our preferential decisions. These are temporal. These are subject to change. One day you might prefer blue. Another day you might prefer black or whatever it might be. Convictions are based on something much more firm. For us, it's something eternal. Convictions are things we should live by. And the Bible comes in at this point, Jesus' words, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That gives us conviction. Jesus, of course, quoting the book of Deuteronomy at that point. If you look at Ezekiel 37, the situation was dire. It was impossible. Imagine you've got to have church, and all you've got in front of you is... A bunch of dry bones. I think there's many pastors who feel that. As they look out on the congregation. And God asks the pastor, can, can any of these live? Lord, you know. You know. But God's instruction to Ezekiel, and I believe by extension to us, is to realize the task that we have is impossible. We cannot make bones come alive. It's very clear that verse 2 and onwards speak of the bones being dry and even very dry. I thought to myself, would it help if they were wet? Not really. But it's just stressing the impossibility of the task for Ezekiel. If he had wet bones, a, a valley full of wet bones, would that help? Not at all. It is just showing the utter power of God in creating the church, the people of God. As we look at Ephesians chapter 2, it speaks to those, it's written to those who were dead in trespasses and sins. Ephesians 2 verse 1. And I can't help but think of the imagery of Ezekiel 37, that there they were dead in transgressions and sins. But verse 4 says, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead, he has made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And it's a perfect analogy, a perfect picture of the task of the preacher. Can any of these folk in front of you live? Lord, I don't know. Unless you come, unless you do something, there's nothing I can do. Here's what the deal is, Ezekiel. Prophesy. In our day, we would say, preach. Tell them what I say. Tell them what I say. Don't dilute it. Don't add to it. Just tell them what I say. And see what the mighty Holy, Holy Spirit will do. What we do here at King's Church is by conviction, not preference. This is not a fad. Should God bless King's Church with more and more people to come? I've often said, but I'll say again, all we will do is all we have been doing. More of the same. More preaching of the Word. More teaching of the Word. More equipping of the saints. More prayer. More things that are, draw us close to God. More, more, more of the same. More people doing it. More heralds. Praise the Lord. 
Oh God, be merciful to us and give us a people that only you can create. And that's what the power of the Word of God can do. If you are alive to God, God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, has spoken to your dry bones, and now by the breath of the Almighty, you live, and you're becoming this mighty army in the hand of God. It's a beautiful picture. Luther was a man of convictions. It was this week, 501 years ago, that he stood in a place called Worms, W-O-R-M-S, spelled in English Worms, but in German it's pronounced Worms. And at that place, it was an imperial diet, which sounds like something you'd eat for a little while. But this diet was a convention where he was summoned, having already been excommunicated by the Pope. He was now ordered to come and speak of his writings. And as his books were put on a table, he was asked simply to repeat one word in Latin, revoco, which meant, I renounce I recant. And this herald of the faith, realizing the enormity of the task and realizing, could he alone be right? Could he be the only one who understands? And fear gripped his heart, I'm sure. We have a record of his prayer the night uh, of this mentioning. And he simply bumbled out a few words and asked if he could have another 24 hours to think about it. And that was given to him. The next day he appeared in the same People, the auspicious elite were around him, knowing that death probably await, uh, was awaiting him, depending on his answer. He was asked, with the books in front of him, his own books, do you recant of your writings? And Luther talked about the fact that many of his books were sanctioned by the church in the sense that they had their approval. I've spoken, I've written of orthodox doctrine. I can't recant of these because the church has said these are great. They said, stop messing around. Tell us, do you recant? They would not move. He realized, he thought he was coming for a debate and opening up the scriptures. That was not allowed him. And then his most famous of famous speeches as he was summoned to give an account of those writings. He said this when he was summoned, stop beating around the bush. In their words, speak without horns. Just, just don't use oratory. Speak candidly. Just say, I recant. That's all we're asking. I recant. Say it, Luther. Revoco. Do you recant? Will you recant? Luther's reply was this. Since your most serene majesty and your highnesses require of me a simple, clear, and direct answer, I will give one, and it is this. I cannot submit my faith either to the Pope or to the Council because it is clear they've fallen into error and even into inconsistency with themselves. And then these words. Unless I'm convinced by sacred scripture or by evident reason, I will not, I cannot recant. For my conscience is held captive by the word of God and to act against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand. I can do no other. God, help me. Those words became synonymous with the doctrine of Scripture alone, sola scriptura. Because there at the Diet of Worms, where literally Luther opened up a can of worms, I believe that's where the expression comes from, by the way, He opened up a can of worms by saying, only the scripture carries with it the weight of divine authority. Only the scripture is breathed out by God. To hell with the Pope, to hell with the the cardinals, to hell with my own thoughts. Scripture alone is the word of God and I stand under it. Scripture alone. Unless God has spoken, I've, I've got nothing. But since he has I stand under it. I cannot do anything else. My conscience is held captive by the word of God. In this impossible situation in Ezekiel chapter 37, as I've said, the bones being wet would be enough. Hardly encouraging. The dry bones. How about very dry bones? There's nothing to work with. There's nothing to work with except God. Except God. Look at verse 10. 
so I prophesied. And so we preach. So I prophesied as he commanded me. And the breath came into, him, into them. And they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. How many bones? We're not told. Very great number. How many bones do you see ahead for you at King's Church? How many people? I don't know. That's in God's hands. I haven't been up a mountain. He hasn't shown me anything, but I've studied and I've prayed and I've got God's Word in my heart and in my mind and in my mouth. That's it. And what He does with it is God's business, not mine. My job is to pray. My job is to study. My job is to meditate, to fix my thoughts on what it says so I'm declaring it accurately. That's it. No other agenda. And I, my job is to preach the Word in season and out of season. You know this? Strawberries... They're either in season or out of season. There's not a separate third category. And so the man of God is to preach the word in season and out of season. That means literally all the time. Preach it when they like it. Preach it when they don't like it. Preach it when people are applauding, when they're giving you likes on Facebook. And preach it when they persecute you and you're thrown in prison. And it doesn't look like anything is happening. Preach the word. That's your assignment. That's your job. Stay at your post, Timothy. I'm leaving. You stay at your post. Don't seek anything but the word of God. It equips you for everything and preach it. Preach it. Preach it. But I preached it and nothing happened. Keep going. Preach it. Preach it. Preach it. Preach it when there's seven there. Preach it when it's 18 there. Preach it when it's back down to nine. Preach it when it's 30. Preach it when it's 10,000. Preach the word. Preach the word. Preach the word. That's it till you die. That's it. No other agenda. I'm going. Stay at your post, Timothy. Man, this is enough to put backbone in the spineless. Praise the Lord. And then do the work of an evangelist. Always include the gospel. The gospel is the power of God. Who wrote that? Paul wrote that. The power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Always include in your message, Timothy. Do the work of an evangelist. Always preach the word, but don't get so much in a data dump that you don't get to the main thing. The main thing is always the main thing. Your job is to keep the main thing the main thing. That's the main thing. Do the work of an evangelist. Tell them the gospel. What is that gospel? That God has created man in his image. and We've defied him with every turn, with every breath, with every thought of the heart and our actions. It's called sin. And God has every right to obliterate all of us. But God so loved this world, he sent his son into the world who was born of a virgin, lived a flawless, perfect life, obeying his father. And that righteous life, that precious life, he then went to the cross and he hung there in the place of sinners. He, the righteous one, the perfect spotless lamb of God, hung in the place of sinners. And he took what we deserved, that amazing of amazingness can ever be fathomed. We might get what he deserved, perfect righteousness, his own righteousness as a gift so that we could stand before God based on someone else's acts of obedience, the obedience of Jesus Christ. So that by faith in Jesus Christ, God says, I knew that was happening and I understood that from eternity and I placed your sins on my son on the cross. He bore your sins in his body on the tree and I have now given you righteousness as a gift. And this Jesus is now raised from the dead at the place of all authority. Here's the good news. You believe in him, You have eternal life, plus nothing. Ask nothing more. Believe in Him. That's it. What a gospel. What good news. It's uh, unfathomable. Religious minds could never, ever grasp grace. Grace is unmerited favor. You don't climb the mountain and then God says, because you climbed, here's this thing called grace. No, while we're dead in sin, at the bottom of the mountain, in fact, down in the dregs of the ocean, the Holy Spirit, if you like, in a sense, dives down, breathes the breath of life into our mortal bodies. We come alive and we're carried to the top of the mountain. That's what we read in Ephesians 2. When we were dead, He did the work. He raised us up. 
to sit with Christ, not in some neutral place, but in heavenly places, the highest place of all authority. We sit with Him in heavenly places now in Christ Jesus. That's your and my standing with the Father right now. Heirs of God, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Do the work of an evangelist. You tell them. You tell them. But I don't feel like it. You tell them. But nothing's happening. You tell them. Uh, eight left last week. You tell them. Tell them. Tell them what? Tell them what the Word says. And see what the Holy Spirit, the mighty Holy Spirit will do in the lives of dead bones. I was dead. I was so dead. It's ridiculous. I was around the Bible growing up. I saw my, my father read the Bible. I had no interest. I was dead towards the things of God. Why do I like it now? Because of preference? That's it? I love just leather-bound books? That's it? No, the mighty Holy Spirit came into a tin tabernacle, it was called, in Chester, England, May the 11th, 1980. And he blew that stony heart out of my heart, out of my chest. Eight minutes before I was not interested. Now I'm interested. And now, 40 years later and more, I'm still interested. Because when God plants his word in the human heart, it's forever. It's the incorruptible seed of the word of God. He starts a project, he finishes it. And that's why I'm convinced concerning you. If indeed God has started a work in you, you will have a desire for God in your heart. He is the one that put it there. Let that be your assurance today. Not your sins this week or last week or what you could possibly do. But is there life in you? Is there something that burns to know the true God and the true gospel? If that's the case, or rather since that's the case. The Holy Spirit has come and hovered over your heart as in the day of Genesis 1 where God said, let there be light. And God has done the same in your heart. Paul writes of it in 2 Corinthians 4. The same God who said, let there be light has shone in your hearts. Give him glory. Give him praise. He's given you life. You had nothing to contribute. You might have had a little essence of religion. There might be a little bit of wetness on the bone but you were dead towards God. And I believe the days of King's Church ahead are glorious, not because of any herald, but because of the God who calls any herald. And I'm believing and I'm praying for many heralds. I'm asking that God will raise up men and women amongst us who will be heralds of the King in our conversations, in the pulpit, yes, but in our conversations, in our prayers, in all of the ways that we can bless humanity around us with the most precious commodity, the Word of God. Ezekiel, don't be moved by what you see, just prophesy. Preacher, don't be moved by what you see, just preach the Word and let the lion loose. That's our mandate, King's Church. Who's with me? Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. We recognize the futility of the flesh. The flesh profits nothing. And as Luther said it, that nothing is not a little something. We've got nothing to contrib contribute to salvation, nor to the activity of God in the saving souls, except to be means whereby the Holy Spirit can work through the word proclaimed. Make us proclaimers. Make us heralds. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.